And we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Love a Compact Live for Wednesday, April the 13th. And we have some special guests on the show today. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Hernandez, here with my co-host, Dr. Nick Bergfeld. And our guests today, um, if they'll go ahead and uh, open their cameras and unmute, we have Susan Gillette and Barbara Walton with the Citizens Climate Lobby. And so they're going to be talking to us today about uh, some things that they have going on and all about their organization. So welcome, Barbara and Susan. Hello. Hi. I think <laughs> my uh, host needs to, un to start my video. Ah. There we go. Okay. Awesome. I think. There we go. Hi. There you are. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I guess we'll just kick it off with uh, and, and whoever would like to take take it from here um, to let the people know all about kind of what what is Citizens Climate Lobby about as far as the organization itself. Oh, OK. Citizens Climate Lobby um, is a national organization that uh, we have a have a local chapter of. It's a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that looks to work together with other, with everyone on climate solutions. Um, and then there's also uh, a Earth Day Lubbock, which we are also here to talk about, which is getting uh, ready for a, uh, a big event on uh, the 22nd. Awesome. And um, so, uh, how long has the organization been around or how long is it, I guess, how long has it been around in general? And then how long has it been in Lubbock? Okay. Now we got to be careful about which one we're talking about because we got two ah. organizations here. We've got Citizens Climate Lobby, which is okay. a chapter of a national organization. And then we have um, Earth Day Lubbock, which is a new organization that we've started here in Lubbock. And that one has only been around, we started in 2020. Um, now, um, so we're going to have to, to figure out which one we want to talk about first. Do we want to talk about both of them? Do you want to talk about one or, and, and then the other so as we don't get confused? Or, or how, how do you want to do this? Well, I think in the, in the course of the conversation, uh, we'll get to both and, and we'll hear about just the, because I, I would assume they're probably very interconnected. In Not that much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're very, okay. very different organizations. Um, so let's start with um, let's start with the Earth Day organization, just because that's something that uh, no, probably nobody has heard about except for those that you've been working with. And, there we um, go. We're out there and, and to talk about what was the the genesis for it. Okay, we just um, you know in 2020 we started this, and I thought you know it's been 50 years since the first Earth Day. And I thought it was time to bring that kind of celebration to Lubbock. And so, of course, we were getting ready for a big event uh, at that year, but it didn't happen. We got closed down for, for 2020 and 2021. And, and so now we're back again. We have um, kind of the structure of a, of a nonprofit, but being our first year, we're, we're kind of learning as we go. Awesome. And, and so uh, what what do you guys have planned for uh, the 22nd as far as activities? Where will this uh, be taking place? All the good stuff. So we are working in conjunction with the city. Um, when we started doing planning this year, we found out the city was also doing some planning for an event, too, at the same time. They started with a, an event in 2019 where they did storm drain uh, murals. And uh, they did that up in the Luca area. So if you are at First Friday Art Trail and, and look around at the storm drains up there, you'll see murals painted. Um, and they were building on that. And of course they got shut down for two years as well. Um, but this year they were, were planning an, a, an event for the same time. And we talked about it and said, let's, let's just get together with this and do it together. Um, so we've been planning this together. Uh, so of course the city has, has some resources that we don't have 
And that's been really nice to work with them um, so that we don't have to do everything. And so who are the, um, the city uh, employee folks that you've been working with? I think it's good to, it sounds like it's been a great uh, partnership that, for y'all. And I'm sure that a lot of citizens typically don't, you know, people who work in civil service here usually don't get a, a acknowledgement. So who, who are the, the folks on the city side that you've been working with? Well, um, Miola Aganovic is the woman that has really spearheaded this. And she is in the stormwater compliance department, which seems like a strange place for Earth Day to be. <laughs> but um, she's also got other departments that are partnering with us. So we've got, you know, when I when I talk to the, the, the people there and we have a meeting at City Hall, we're talking to solid waste and recycling and parks and recreation and all kinds of other departments too that are, are connected with, with this event. And how is that, because I, I think about it, the engagement that you have, it sounds wonderful. The engagement and how much the city is wanting to play a role in this. I, for me as a Lubbock citizen, it's honestly just wonderful to hear uh, that that's where the conversation is. You know, the two of you have advocated on, on some of these issues for some time. You know, how have you seen that work change here in Lubbock in, in the time that you have been involved? Well, it's, it's not having had an event yet. It, we haven't seen all that much change because it, we just, the, we feel like this is, this is our inaugural year, really. Um, and being an, being an organization that is mainly focused on a single event a year. And um, so we, we hope to, at some point, um, do some other events over over the year too but our main focus is just a single event in the year and so it's it's going to take a while at that rate but i can say in general over the years that the last three or four years i see a lot of people who are more interested in the environment and the earth and climate than you know it's hard to ignore now yeah. Yeah. And so um, is this going to be like a citywide event or what, what would this kind of look like on Earth Day? This is going to be a citywide event there. The uh, event will take place downtown um, mm. in the area of Broadway and Avenue K. And uh, so that's kind of the center of the event. And then if you go one block in every direction from that center, that's the area that they're going to close down the streets. Oh. Um, so it's going to be four city blocks worth of event. Um, mm. And it's, it's got a, quite a lot of stuff going on in it. Barbara, you want to talk about some of the things? Sure. There's going to be live music. I think we have three different bands performing and there's, going to be food trucks and we have a hundred participants, everything from, you know, uh, science spectrum and Lubbock Lake landmarks and children's lipstick, maybe <laughs> a little bit of everything. And we have electric vehicles and we've got electric uh, electrified bicycles and solar. And we've got a, the coolest wind generator you've ever seen. <laughs> We're very excited to see that. We haven't actually seen it either, only in pictures. And there, so uh, uh, Flower Turbines is the company that is making that uh, product. And they're just coming into Lubbock and looking at this as where they're going to start manufacturing these tulip turbines that um, the smallest of which is one meter high. Um, and so these are little things that you can stick anywhere and generate power wherever you, wherever you are. So it, it's really looking like it could be a game changer for wind energy in a distributed energy environment where, where you were trying to shrink um, the, the, the size of, of a local grid where you can generate all of your energy and hold it within a 
a local area. I think that's that's looking like something that they could do in, with this. Oh, that's it's exciting. And just as a to hear about how Lubbock citizens would be able to touch some of these new technologies, uh, to be able to interact with them. In my own experience, I think sometimes uh, we can be a bit behind the times uh, in Lubbock. So we live in a community where we have very, very high uh, solar capacity ratings. We have mm -hmm. many sunny days, we have very little cloudy days, and yet the amount of solar panels that you see installed in the community are less than say in Vermont or even say Germany or, or places where there's not nearly as much sunlight, uh, not nearly as much, uh, you know, not cloudy days. Why, from y'all's perspective, why do you think that is? Why is that the case here? Well, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into that. When we look at the maps of wind and solar potential, this area right here is smack dab in the middle of the perfect place to be. You know, you, we have the wind potential goes north and south along this line up from here up into North Dakota. And the highest solar potential goes from California to Florida, right across the south. And if you put those two maps together, we have the best area. And it is also true that when you have wind and solar together, that they have a better coverage and you get um, you have greater potential for full coverage during the day as opposed to only during the sunlight hours or only during the windy times. Um, and so we are, you're right, we are in the perfect place for wind and solar. Um, and I think that's coming. I think more of that is coming, um, but we kind of have to get a mind shift that this is the way things are, gonna, are, are are moving toward and a lot of people are hanging on to what they consider the the way things have always been which is oil and gas and a lot of people are heavily invested in oil and gas and don't want to see what's what's coming down the way and that's why earth day will be so important because it will expose people to what's out there that they've never seen before. I mean, they may have seen a solar panel here and there, but they don't know what's really available, but they'll be able to talk to people and get a better idea. They'll be able to actually look at the electric vehicles and see what they look like. Things are not as scary or as distant if you can actually put your hands on them. And even combining these technologies together, Susan, I think you said it so well in talking about how solar and wind go well together. Many people don't know that wind generation in the nighttime is actually quite, quite robust. Yes. And so by having these, you're still getting some amount of generation. And even just having those conversations, I personally have found uh, to be difficult sometimes in the community. I once gave a presentation to the City of Lubbock's Utility Board on this topic and had one of the board members tell me that this would, something like that, renewable energy sources will never truly work uh, because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And that's the reason why it's, it's not something as a community we should consider pursuing. You know, so the work that y'all are doing is so meaningful, even at the level of knowledge and just conveying this information about all the exciting technologies that many of them have already been commercialized and, and we can see in the marketplace and are accessible today uh, that has happened around our community and, and across the globe. Yes, indeed. The, the people just have to be exposed to this to get the idea that this can really happen. Um, the, the, if they see what this actually looks like, that they might be more able to envision themselves doing this kind of, of uh, energy generation for their own home. Um, we also have uh, solar panel companies who are coming. Um, a couple of them include uh, SolarTech Energy Solutions and Excel Construction 
um, who does solar panel installations. Those are two of the companies who are sponsoring Earth Day Lubbock and making this event be able to come to you through our organization, as well as flower turbines. And we've got a couple other other sponsors that we want to thank too, um, because we couldn't do this without their support. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you who else they are. Yeah. Um, we have two other two. We have two uh, car companies who have sponsored us. The first is Gene Messer Toyota, and of course the Toyota cars have. There's a lot of EVs and hybrids that are coming down in in uh, Toyota. And usually don't get this kind of uh, commercial <laughs> interlude here, do you? <laughs> I'm happy to do yeah. it. If this is something they're sponsoring, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I, I think that's important for us to acknowledge that. So the other, the other company is uh, Mears Mazda. Oh, wow. And um, they are also bringing cars to the, to the show. And there will also be a couple other companies i won't tell you who you'll just have to come and find out what kind of vehicles they're bringing um but we should have a good uh selection for you of what these kinds of things look like um i know that people here are not used to thinking of being able to drive an electric car um they can't fathom that but if you actually see one and talk to somebody who's had one then you can then you can start to envision what this looks like in your own life, and that's part of what we want to do too is just get people exposed to different kinds of of uh, products and uh, organizations that are doing some of some of these these kinds of work that they haven't seen before. Um, so just to go through and make sure we've caught all of our sponsors, um, another sponsor is Alcove Farms. They are the ones you see their eggs. <laughs> you can go buy their eggs at United, but they are doing a kind of regenerative farming practices that are not seen in, in most um, commercial egg businesses. So we want to see what they're doing and talk about how this is better for the land this is better for us all to be to be farming in ways that are uh going to feed the soil and feed the earth um more than take away from it and the last one is jti inc which is a an apartment uh management company and they have generously given to us as well so that we can bring this event to you. Um, and I think, I think that's all, Barbara, is it? I think so. No, that, that's still an impressive list for the first year of, of an entirely new, uh, well, I guess this, you had, you'd already been, you know, working on this for a little bit longer than a year, but now that you're finally able, coming out of the pandemic to have this in the community, uh, that's, that's really successful in, in my book, the amount of partnerships that you've created uh, and it really just shows the interest and energy and goodwill, I think, in the community right now uh, on these issues of, of, of climate and renewable energy and uh, what the 21st century is supposed to look like when it comes to energy. Yes. Yes, Yeah, indeed. so um, uh, I, had, I did have a question that I thought of as you were talking. So as, uh, going back to the solar panels, um, I, I'm sure you're aware that Lubbock is uh, about to change its utilities or the way that we get electric utilities. So there's probably going to be more choices of companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so some things are going to change there. Do you, uh, do you see, I guess, do you foresee that having any effect on the adoption of solar panels? Do you think that will speed it up? Do you think it'll stay the same? Um, have you seen anything uh, that would indicate that for maybe some other places? I know that what the electric companies do in terms of their policy for people who have solar panels um, <clears throat> can change the adoption of solar panels. Mm -hmm. And I know what the situation is under under um, LPNL, but I don't know how that's going to change when we go to anything else. Um, it will depend on who comes. 
you know, which other companies offer service and, you know, whatever they, whatever they're willing to do. Now, you might be able to answer this question better than us, Nick, about um, when we change to competition in energy selection, we will still be having the same poles and wires company that we've always had. And they're the ones that set the local rates and how they, how they uh, collect, how, how they price what's going through your wires. Right, so in the, uh, in the ERCOT marketplace, you, whenever you're paying for your electricity, it really is two, two different buckets. One is the bucket that goes to the company that generated the energy. And the other bucket is what goes to the company that helped get that electron to you. And so in Lubbock, when we transition, Lubbock <coughs> Power and Light becomes something called a Transmission Distribution Utility mm -hmm. Service Provider, a TDUSP. And in that role, uh, Lubbock Power and Light will still be on your bill in a way in that they'll charge effectively for using their, elect uh, their electrical lines and their electrical infrastructure to get that electron to you. In the ERCOT marketplace, typically it's about a third of your utility bill is transmission distribution utility uh, costs. So those two buckets of you paying for the electricity and you paying for the um, ability to get that electricity to you, two third, the, the bucket paying for the electricity is two thirds of your bill and the paying for the wires is one third of your bill. And so uh, Lubbock Power and Light will still for better or for worse be a, a part of all of our lives uh, even as we transition into uh, the retail electric market but it, it does offer some opportunities for innovation when it comes to things like solar panels. Mm -hmm. So in Lubbock a big challenge is that LPNL gets to set the rates for whatever it wants, and it, it can use whatever it so desires to determine what those rates are. And so there's no restrictions on how they do it. And so LPNL, if you have solar panels in Lubbock today, they do not provide you significant compensation for energy that you generate with your solar panels, something that's called net metering. And so when these retail electric provider companies come to Lubbock, they will have their own types of contracts and arrangements where sometimes they'll help you finance buying your own solar panels. Sometimes they will pay uh, a fee effectively to put solar panels on top of your house and they would still own the solar panels. They're effectively leasing your rooftop so that they can generate energy on site because every time you create an electron right where it's going to be used, if you remember the cost of the, those two buckets of where you're having to pay for energy in Texas, that's effectively cutting out that uh, Lubbock Power and Light in this example, the, the transmission distribution utility company. And so that electron is about a third cheaper than if you had to get one that was sent to you across a big distance to get to you. So there are gonna be some changes that are exciting um, that are going to open up opportunities for innovation. Now I will say as a city, and as our, as our own utility company, we absolutely could have made these programs ourselves. Uh, we absolutely could have done that metering ourselves. We absolutely could have done financing for solar panels on people's rooftops. All of these things were within our own current capacities as a city to achieve and do and execute on. As a, as a the city's leadership opted to not do any of those and instead to move into the direction of uh, allowing for market competition. Right. So even when we go to the competition, LPNL will have control of things like net metering. I would think that that's not going to change. Oh, no. So it's um, LPNL's role is uh, if a power line goes down, they're the ones who are going out and fixing it. Um, reading your meter, that's something that they're still going to be involved in doing. Right. But everything else, like the cost of your electricity, the payment plan that you do for it, whether you have solar panels, don't have solar panels, they actually won't play much of a role in that process anymore. So uh, Lubbock Power and Light, they will not set the rate. The market will set the rate for the cost per kilowatt hour. And similarly, the cost of compensation that you receive for energy generation 
will also be determined by the marketplace rather than a specific rate that is, that is set by Lubbock Power Line. Okay, the, one of the things, I'll run this by you too. One of the things that makes having solar panels more expensive in Lubbock than they could possibly be is that when you put solar panels on, the LPNL changes your meter to mm -hmm. a different meter and that meter costs you about $30 a month more to have than um, a regular meter does. Um, which cuts down a lot in your savings for right. what you get out of your solar panels. But then in terms of net metering, do you know for certain that other places in the state that they have, have access to companies that do net metering with them, full net right. metering, not just a rollback of the, of the meter? So not, not full net metering per se. Uh, in Texas, in the, in the deregulated market, we don't have net metering in the same way where you're given a specific rate for energy that goes back onto the grid, like say in California. Instead, what happens is that your meter, so long as you have a smart meter, and that's one of the good things that um, Lubbock's leadership did was they found financing for a smart meter installs across the city, and we're and we've gone through that. We've been going through that process. We're I can't remember actually how far along we are in, in the final installs. But so long as your house has a smart meter, uh, you should be able to calculate both how much energy you put onto the grid, as well as how much energy you take off the grid. So that accounting will all happen through uh, wireless communication, will all happen uh, in, a, in a very large uh, marketplace, a very large um, database that uh, the regulator in the state of Texas for this marketplace called ERCOT maintains. And so all that data gets used and, and added together with everyone else that participates in the market. And that's what determines a price in any moment in time. And prices in ERCOT fluctuate in 15 second intervals. So, you know, net metering in that way, it's all about when you're generating energy in terms of what kind of compensation you would get for it because the market is constantly fluctuating in terms of pricing. Well, this will be exciting to see. There's some things that I have some misgivings about with us moving to ERCOT, and we will mm -hmm. have to kind of wait and see how this all plays out when we finally get the whole package deal in place. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting. F 15 years ago or so, as a community, we made a choice, and we've sort of been on that path ever since. And so, sometimes I, I think it's important to have moments of reflection or uh, considerations for how the world around us has changed uh, during that period in time. But that is the, the ship has sailed in that way and, and we've effectively been on the same journey. Um, since that point. Right, right. So that was a little bit of an aside from our conversation, all of this. Yeah, for uh, sure. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the ramifications of, of solar in your personal residence is, uh, a big topic. Yes, absolutely. And so something, you know, just to be more uh, topical about things happening uh, day to day, y'all probably saw about the brush fire, the massive fires that outside of, and I'm curious, you know, one of the difficulties in talking about climate is talking about climate. And, and what are the words that you use when you're trying to talk with somebody who is either skeptical or uh, doesn't find that it's something that's believable is that the climate could be changing. How, how would y'all talk about, um, say, an, an issue like the, you know, so this, you, you could never ascribe one in instance or event as being a result of climate change, but we know that in our area that we will have a statistical increase in extreme weather events, such as uh, large scale grass fires being blown by 30 mile plus per hour winds and no precipitation. And so how, how would y'all approach that conversation with a Lubbock citizen, you know, when, and trying to orient them around, look, you, you have to, you know, this is something that we have to address, uh, these changes that are happening in our community. Well, the first place I start with that is to talk about the difference between weather and climate, that mm -hmm. that is something that people don't understand. And when you talk about weather, you're talking about what's happening outside your, your 
door at this moment in time um, or any moment in time, or even you might even say, what's the weather going to be like this week or, you know, some short period of time and, and, and being precise about those, those being able to forecast what's going to happen next week or next month is very difficult. And so people have a hard time of seeing, well, if you can't, if you can't forecast, you know, a few weeks away, how can you forecast 10 years away? How does that work? And that's because weather and climate are two different things. You can't predict exactly what the weather is going to be, but the climate is a much larger period of time. You have to have at least 30 years worth of data before you can see which way the, the, the climate is going. Because the weather day to day goes up and goes down. You have warm days and cold days. Even when it's summer, you might have cold days. Even when it's winter, you have, you have hot and cold days in any season. And how do you measure that? How do you, how do you tell what's going on in the long run? Well, you go out there with your thermometer and take readings all the time for years and years, for at least 30 years. And then you can look at that data record and that data record is what your climate is. And if you look at that, you can see which way you're going. And that with um, some other measurements of things like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which have been measured very carefully for since middle of the 1900s, um, you can see a correlation between the carbon going up and the temperature going up from those <clears throat> measurements. And from that, you can see, okay, if our carbon keeps going up, our temperatures are keep going up and that's what we're following. So it has, it, it makes a distinction between, oh, I don't see what's wrong with the, with the weather, it's fine outside or, um, how can we tell what's going on outside? Um, you know, it always changes, right? Yes, it always changes. But what, what direction is it taking generally? And that's what you, you have to look at. That's where I start. And it depends on who you're talking to. You know, whether you're talking to a professor from tech or a farmer or a kid, you know, it depends. You you create a conversation based on the environment you're in. And I want to pick on that thread of, you mentioned a farmer, you know, and the agricultural community here, uh, it's pretty diverse in terms of a lot of different mm -hmm. crops that are grown. You know, what kinds of, when y'all work with the agricultural community, have you noticed there are certain kinds of farmers or, or folks within the community that are more inclined to be thinking about climate than others? Uh, my experience is most of the smaller farmers, mm -hmm. but the big farmers see what's happening. They see what's happening to the water tables. They see what's happening to early, early uh, springs and late summers. They know what's happening better than any of us because that's their bread and butter. But typically for me, it's the smaller farmers, the little organic farmers or the regenerative farmers that are much more inclined to understand and be aware i think they're more in touch with that yeah can you um and and you brought up the regener regenerative farming um and uh I, I think that's pretty interesting can you kind of talk a little bit about what are some things that folks do to regenerate the soil um because just for anybody out there listening that doesn't or isn't aware when you're farming, especially over a long period of time, the soil can degrade. And so I'm interested in hearing how, how, how do folks uh, combat that with this uh, type of farming? It's, it's a whole range of things that they do, but basically what they do is they work with the earth and they feed the earth instead of draining the earth dry or destroying it. Instead of plowing fields every spring and leaving them after they've harvested whatever and leaving them bare to blow away they plant cover crops or cattle if you have cattle on a free range you know they whenever they uh 
well, how do I say this? Whenever they make their little cow patties, they squish them down with their little hooves. So that's good for the earth. Anything you can put back into the earth is good for it. If you're planting the same crop over and over and over again every year and you're put, putting herbicides and fertilizers, artificial herbicides and, and chemicals on it, it makes a difference. It's like the Alco farms, you know, the, the birds are in the basket, in the crate that rolls from one place to another. They eat the bugs there, you know, they fertilize it as they go along. And so it's good for everyone. So there's, you know, being city folk ourselves, I don't know that I, I, I'm not an agricultural expert, but I have been hearing a whole lot about some of these things. And there's ways in which they're finding that we can take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soils, depending on how they do their farming. And as Barbara says, if you don't leave your, your crop, your, your fields bare, if you leave the stubble in the, in the field, for it to decompose and go back into the soil, to feed the soil, to feed the organisms that live in the soil. Um, you also take and put that carbon back into the soil, which makes your soil more fertile and also takes the carbon out of the atmosphere that we've been putting into it that is making our, our earth warm up. So it's all kind of a process that works together. Um, and there is, uh, with Citizens Climate Lobby, one of the things that they're working on is some agricultural legislation. Um, um, now I'm going to have to think about what <laughs> what the bill is called. Uh, it's and it, it has to do with farmers having particular ways in that that they do their farming, so that they're not plowing the dirt that they're just leaving it as much as they can intact and to draw that carbon down into the earth. And if they do that, if they practice their farming in certain ways, they can get money for those practices, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. doing those practices, that they're actually taking the carbon out of the air and they're getting paid for it. But they, that's a bill that's been rolling around in Congress for now. Um, growing Climate Solutions, there it is. Now I thought about it. That's the legislation, the name of the legislation that, that CCL is, is, is working to, to get passed. Um, but we also have to, when you're talking about legislation like that, you have to talk too about what it's going to take for the farmers to actually uh, take this idea and make it make it a practice in their fields to sign up for this program. And that's where we have to do a lot of education in the agricultural community and finding the people, the scientists and the farmers who know what they're doing more than I do about what happens in the field and being able to talk to other to other people in the farming community to be able to to figure all those things out. Um, that's there again, that's another thing that people just have to start talking about it. The more you talk about these issues, the more you can understand what's going on. And my understanding is anything you plant is a carbon sink, basically. Trees are one of the best things, planting trees is one of the best things you can do for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, lots of good information here. Um, so is uh, where, where can folks find out uh, or keep up with, I should say, the Earth Day um, festivities? Do you have a website or is it mostly on Facebook? We have a website, um, which is earthdaylbk.com. And we have a Facebook account, we have Twitter, we have Instagram. If you go to our, our website, you will find the links to all the, the social media on there. Um, it will also have a link to the city page. The city has a page for, for the Earth Day on Broadway Festival. And uh, you can find out more about it there. Um, 
so there, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of information there. We just have to figure out how to get the people to to see the information and come to the festival. That's what we're working on now. Is is you know we've got these hundred booths coming with all kinds of information about all kinds of things, and we've got all this stuff happening. But we need to get the people there that's what's going to really count as our success for this event. So um, we're trying to find ways to, to get that information to the people. We've got um, a lot of flyers. I'll show you here. This is one of our little flyers that we're putting ar out around town and it has information about who the, the bands are and the um, some of the booths, it says on the back, the booths, some of the booths are featuring kids activities, solar and wind energy, arts and craft, electric vehicles, pet adoptions, gardenings. Those are some of the categories of, of things that are going to be happening there. Um, so we're putting these, these uh, flyers out all over town if someone's listening and they know of a place where we can put flyers or posters where people can pick them up to get more information. Um, let us know. There's a there's a, a contact us page at the bottom of the web page. Um, just let us know, and we'll bring you stacks of of flyers for you to pass out to your friends, family, school members, business partners, customers, whatever. And you can send a link for the social media information, you know, if they need a graphic that they want to print themselves or post themselves. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I, you know, to, for wrap up on my side, I'm just very appreciative of the work that y'all do in Lubbock and trying to bring awareness uh, to these topics in, in a community that I would say has been a bit allergic uh, these conversations for a long time and to see the work that y'all are doing to hear of all the collaborators that you brought together uh, to be able to do this Earth Day celebration I think it really I'm optimistic I'm, I'm excited I'm optimistic and I'm grateful for the work that y'all do thank you yeah it's I would definitely uh, I would definitely echo that and um, hopefully you know in in the near future sometime we can have some government officials who take this stuff a little more seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I think that this is something uh, I mean we've talked about it my entire life. I'm you know I'm 41 years old at this point and I know that as long as I've been alive we've been discussing climate change and the dangers of it and we've been watching things unfold. And, uh, you know, some, some of the rhetoric is, is disheartening, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that uh, this is the beginning of a movement to change that. And uh, I, I'm all for continuing this Earth Day Lubbock every single year and trying to make it bigger and bigger, um, because I, I just think it is really important that we move in that direction. And I'm not even, you know, uh, I, I know a lot of folks get uh, worried or get anxious when we start talking about renewable energy um, because they think we're going to take away something, right? Um, and I, I think that there's a way that it, there could be a mix and uh, we can phase things out over a long period of time if they're no longer beneficial. And so it's not going to be overnight either way it goes. And I, I think that um, that's just something I'd like to express to people out there. If, you know, as we go to renewable energy, um, we're not burning everything down, you know, Right. Um, it, it, you know, everything will be okay. But, but I do think that we're going to need a mix. And I think that's pretty much the general consensus in the scientific community. Um, and just hope, ho hope we can move this forward, but I'm going to be there at Earth Day Lubbock. I know that I've been okay. excited about this since I saw Miss Barbara out at first Friday art trail and she handed me a flyer. Oh, um, right. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about it. And we will definitely be helping you guys promote on our page and, and all of that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited, excited about it. Right. So, Can I talk for a minute about yeah. Citizens Climate Lobby since you yeah. talked about, um, so Citizens Cl Climate Lobby is kind of the political side of this. Um, and But what I like about CCL is that we don't ask very, 
we, we don't ask people for money usually. What we ask from them is their time and engagement, is that we try to teach other people how to talk to their political representatives, which mm. most people don't know how to do or you know are, are fearful of. I was there too, but what the what that organization does is bring people in and says, okay, let's go together and talk to this person that you otherwise wouldn't talk to. Let's find common ground in which we can have a conversation about energy issues, about climate issues, what it is that we need to do to move forward. So we as Lubbock Citizens Climate Lobby have talked to, we talked regularly to Mr. Arrington's office, and we have talked many, we, we have talked a lot to also our state representatives, um, Mr. Perry, uh, Dustin Burroughs, uh, John Frulo, we've talked to all of their offices as well as a few other offices around the Panhandle area in state legislature. And we talked to them about, um, how, how these transitions are not all bad. Um, we've been talking about how if you bring wind and solar energy into a county on a utility scale uh, development, how much money that brings into the county, mm -hmm. uh, into the county coffers mm -hmm. as tax and how much that money goes into the farmer's pockets. If you're a landowner and you've got wind and solar on your on your property, how much does that make you? How much of that goes into the county tax funds? How does that build that community so that you can have a thriving economy in that county that would otherwise be, you know, everyone's moving out of these little towns and the county has got nothing. And so if you put that kind of economic value back into the community, how this builds and that you can have the wind and solar and sell it to other places around, around the state, um, because at this point we can't export it across state lines because of ERCOT. <laughs> um, and um, so, so talking to them about these kinds of issues, about economic issues, that makes it something that they can have a conversation with us about. Um, and so we're talking about solutions and a lot of people get, mm -hmm. get caught up on the solutions of climate change. And so they don't want to talk about the problem. So this is a way we can we can get, get that conversation started is when we find out what you're concerned about. And how do you, um, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Uh, one more thing, yeah. vote. Oh. Everybody <laughs> needs to vote. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, I guess that may, that may possibly answer the question I was going to ask. So <laughs> okay. how, how do you feel that those conversations have gone when you had those conversations with the state representatives and, and all of that? They've gone amazingly well. You okay. know, we get, we find that we're having conversations where they are listening to what we're saying. And if, as, as we go back over and over again and extend that conversation every time we talk to them, you know, we, we build this rapport and we find we can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, we're not gonna change um, the whole political atmosphere of this part of the world overnight, but we can have those conversations with the representatives that we do have to make thing, to push things in, the, in, in a direction that's positive. Yeah, um, I think that's a perfect segue into my end of show rant <laughs> that I normally do. Um, uh, you know, everybody that, that watches this program knows that we're all about uh, building those coalitions and collaborating with folks. Even when we don't agree on every single point, I think that's unrealistic to think that any, any group, uh, even those that are aligned, are going to agree 100% of the time. Families don't do that. I don't know any human beings that do that. Um, but it's important and, and, and that's so encouraging to hear that this is how you're approaching these issues because you're right. That's what it's going to take if, if you, um, you know, 
raise the proverbial crowd with the pitchforks and go outside the Capitol, that's not going to really help much. you right. Um, because you have to look at it from their side, right? Uh, that, that's exactly. a bit of an aggressive approach. Um, and so uh, if, if you can go in and just have a conversation and uh, learn where each other are coming from and discuss these things, uh, you can find at least some version of a middle ground. I always say that, you know, in any advocacy uh, around any issue really um, that, that involves two or more groups, nobody's gonna get 100% of what they want you're at best going to get about 80% of you want of, of what you want, you know? Um, but, but it's going to take whatever percentage that works out to, it's going to take everybody working together on it. And uh, I've, I've had a chance to talk to some of our state representatives and meet them. And um, from the conversations I've had with them, they seem like reasonable folks and folks that people can talk to. And I hope that that remains the case. So um, thank you very much for what you guys do. Um, uh, I, I wish you nothing but the best of luck in all of that. And we're rooting for you. We're going to be cheerleaders for you over here. Uh, this is obviously something that Lubbock Compact is uh, very passionate about as far as the environment and um, mm -hmm. all of that good stuff. So thank you. And thank you for coming on the show. And I hope everybody will share this video uh, far and wide. And I hope to see everybody out there at Earth Day Lubbock. I mean, I'm encouraging you all to come out. It's something new. It's something that doesn't really happen around here all the time. And you get to learn about all these new things. If you're curious uh, about how some of this stuff works, electric cars or uh, the tulip wind yeah, uh, so machines, awesome. yeah. you know, um, <laughs> you never know. You never know what could happen from going to one of these events. But uh, but I can guarantee that, that you'll learn something. And so Thank you once again, and this will be your uh, weekly reminder to join your neighborhood association, and we will be right back here uh, next Wednesday. And so thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks.